Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. Before I get on to what I had actually planned for Lecture 5, I wanted to cover two things briefly from Lecture 4. So first of all, uh, Mr. Deepak Rajendra Prasad asked a very good question. Um, couldn't the private multiplicative weights algorithm have been run using noise scaled to square root k log 1 over delta over epsilon directly without having to compose it with itself uh, and without noising the initial threshold? And the answer to his question is yes. And in fact, that's how the algorithm was originally written. But the proof of privacy is much more complicated than the proof that I showed you yesterday uh, via composition. So the point was to give you a new and simpler proof. But he was right. I also wanted to clarify the last two slides because I ran out of time and got a little flustered. So I just want to go over what was happening in the boosting algorithm. Remember that in the boosting algorithm, we chose a small set of k queries. We call those samples. And we feed these to the base learner. So the key step is feeding k queries to the base sanitizer uh, to obtain an object that does well, that is, answers within some bound, error bound of lambda, on a 1 half plus eta fraction of the distribution. So to do this, we actually need to show three things. The first is really magic, and that's why it's in a different color. It's uh, a generalization bound that shows for every m, and I'll give you the formal statement, although not the proof, on the next slide. If we have an m-bit object, m-bit, so we're measuring it in bits, an m-bit long object that gives lambda accurate answers for the database on a randomly chosen set of k queries where k is bigger than m. So it's a small number of bits compared to the number of queries, not measured in bits, just number of queries that it answers. Then with high probability, it uh, gives you a good answers on a significant, you know, significantly more than half of D, so most of D. You also need a higher level explanation of how we build the base learner, including the number of samples that we need and the role of the Laplace noise in that process. And then, for homework, you can count. So we'll have some T rounds. We have K samples per round. The only place where we're losing privacy is on these samples. We get k times t samples total. Each sample we saw from the attenuated reweighting has sensitivity 1 over mu. And this will tell us how we have to scale sigma. And then we need to go back and check that we can build a, a base learners that have such a fat sigma and still have enough accuracy. And that will tell us how large we can hope the query set Q will be. So it's another one of these situations where you have three or four interrelated uh, parameters, and you just have to sort of work on them and, and, and try to fit them together. So the, the lemma, uh-oh. Oh, yeah. So let's start with the high-level explanation of how we build the base learner. It's very, very easy. Suppose we have some number k of samples, we're going to take some number k of samples, where k is going to be more or less times n log of the universe size, where this is the universe of data elements. So this, is, this factor kappa is going to be bigger than 1. All right. Now, for every query in that sample set, we're going to use the Laplace mechanism to get an approximate answer for the value of the database on that query, Q of x, we add Laplace noise. So that's our approximation of response R of x, which has privacy now built in because of the Laplace mechanism. So this gives me a bunch of answers to these queries. 
approximate answers to these queries. And now, this is for arbitrary query sets, not counting queries. We're going to exhaustively search in a ridiculous amount of time that's just too embarrassing to discuss. We're going to exhaustively search through all n row databases. Remember that our original database had size n. So it certainly gives good answers to these queries, but there will also be others that give pretty good answers to these queries. So we're going to exhaustively search for a database that's n rows. That means it's exactly m, which is n times log of the universe size number of bits long. OK? And that database, which we find by, ex th th and this thing has to um, give relatively accurate answers where accuracy now is to this noisy thing, not to the truth. If it's close to the noisy thing and nothing weird happened in the Laplace sampling, it will be close to the truth. But we're ensuring privacy by using R of X here rather than the true Q of X. All right, so we're looking for an N row thing that, that does well, has an error of most lambda over two on every query in our sample set. Now notice that this is N log N bits. This is something bigger than n log n queries. So the presence of k means that y is shorter than the number of queries that it's answering. And that was the condition that I described on the previous slide. Okay? The generalization bound looks like this. You don't really have to internalize it too much, and I'll just show you a little intuition on the next slide why it works. Here's kappa. You can verify later that this is, in fact, bigger than 1. So what it says is, if we have a small string that answers enough queries pretty well, then it will, in fact, give you something that answers most of D with high probability, high probability over the choice of samples. So here's the key observation. Consider any m-bit string y, which is a candidate synthetic output. You know we're going to exhaustively search. So we have one candidate, then the next candidate, then the next candidate. Once we have fixed this string y, there is some set, let's call it b sub y, the bad queries for y. On this bad set, the value that we get on y is far from the value on the database, all right? So every string y may have a non-empty bad set. Now, if the fraction of strings that are bad for y from the universe of queries as a whole is bigger than m over s, what's the probability when we randomly choose S, that Y will sort of be good for everybody that we chose. There's, we have this Y. Y has a big fraction of bad queries. We're going to choose a random set of queries. What's the chance that we miss all the bad ones? If we miss all the bad ones, we might not rule out Y. If we hit a bad one, we'll definitely rule out Y. So what's the chance that we miss all of them and we don't rule Y out? Well, a little bit of arithmetic shows that that's going to look like e to the minus m. Now, how many bad y's are there? Homework. With high probability, simultaneously for all y where by is large, s will intersect by, thereby knocking y out. So this is what I should have told you yesterday, and that's Okay? Good. So, the themes for the lectures so far were, first lecture was definitional and Laplace mechanism, randomized response. The second lecture was selection and the connection to uh, economics. The third lecture was privacy as a random variable. The fourth lecture was sort of 
the heavy learning kind of stuff and concise representations and sparse vectors. And the fifth lecture is basically fun and games. So this is going to be an easy lecture. Remember the subsample and aggregate paradigm of Nisim Raskodnikova and Smith. So the idea was you have some function, you don't necessarily understand your function, you want to compute f of your database in a private way, you have no idea what the sensitivity of your function is, so you can take your data, partition it randomly into blocks, apply the function to each block independently, and then somehow aggregate the results in a privacy-preserving way. That was the paradigm. What happens when your function is Steve Feinberg? Steve Feinberg is a statistician. Uh, he's very interested and has done a lot of work on confidentiality. And he says, I must see raw data. I cannot work through a privacy-preserving interface that doesn't let me stare at raw data. Now, I trust Feinberg. I trust his intentions. I trust that he'll be honorable. But even he could accidentally study the data and release some statistic that is somehow disclosive, even though he didn't mean it to be. So, let's conceptualize Feinberg as a function, right? It's just some function. I don't know the sensitivity of this function. I don't understand this function. I, doesn't, I don't know what happens in the statistician's brain when he sees raw data. He cannot explain this to me, but I trust him, so let's call him a function. So suppose Feinberg is energetic, and if I take the data and I split it up into blocks, he's willing to analyze each block completely de novo, completely from the beginning, as if he'd never seen anything. He doesn't remember when he's looking at block number two what happened in block number one. All right. Well, how do I aggregate what Feinberg does? So, you know, he looks at this stuff. He decides he wants to publish various statistics. What do I do? How do I aggregate my Feinbergs? Okay. So, and, and then the, the game for him, I mean, my, my ground rules will be, okay, Steve, you can look at the data, but you must follow these instructions. You have to, you know, re repeat your activity with a fresh mind on each block, and you have to feed your, your intermediate results into the private aggregator and never tell the world anything except what the aggregator says. Those are the rules. So what's the motivation for this problem other than arguing with Feinberg on a public stage? So he wants to do research and he wants to publish the results of his research. And he's going to write a paper, maybe, that will say, well, you know, like, he might say, look, I'll look at the raw data and then I'll figure out what statistic it is I want to publish. Then I will use a differentially private algorithm to publish that statistic. Is it safe or is it not safe? Let's say that again. I let Feinberg look at the data. Suppose I don't make him, I don't do sample and aggregate. I just let him look at the data, decide what he wants to publish, and then take that statistic and compute it with a differentially private estimator and release it. Is that safe? No, good, why not? Well, the paper is going to say, using differentially private robust regression, we find a link between income and health. What the paper won't tell you was, I chose to use a robust res uh, regression because the billionaire Warren Buffett was in the data set. But it may still be true. So the fact that he chose robust regression is not a differentially private thing. He wouldn't have chosen it, perhaps, had Warren Buffett not been in the data set. The chance of choosing a robust regression is zero without Buffett, non-zero with Buffett, so we have a violation of differential privacy. 
So what we want to do is we want to make the choice of computations private. Which thing it is you are going to compute in a differentially private way to show the public, that choice has to be made private. And we don't know how Feinberg decides what to do. So that's the motivation for that problem. So here's one solution. We can aggregate using the exponential mechanism. So uh, well, let's say there are, there's a, a menu of items of functions that, that Feinberg might choose to release to the public. So on one block, so here, here's the menu of, of functions, the hat, the shoe, the car, the dog. Do you recognize these toys from the game Monopoly? Okay, so, so on 15 of the blocks it says the shoe. I want to publish robust regression. On no blocks does it say I want to do logistic regression. On three blocks it says I want to, I don't know, you know, make something up, all right, and so on. So we just, you know, take these votes and we apply the exponential mechanism to determine with high probability, if, if there's a strong majority guy, that'll be chosen, right? So the nice thing is it will always return a valid outcome and it's guaranteed to be epsilon zero differentially private. But a little bit of thinking ends up showing you that you need a lot of blocks to do this, even if Feinberg always makes the same choice. So here's another solution. Instead, we could try the proposed test release method. We do everything as we started before, but for aggregation, what we do is we test for a strong majority. Is there a potential item, a toy, so that a strong majority of the blocks say publish that statistic. And if so, we go ahead and we publish that statistic in a differentially private way. And otherwise, we just say, hey, you know, the Feinberg's all over the map here. This isn't a good computation. And we quit. Maybe in this case, we would go back and use, uh, I don't know, never mind. We just, we just fail. So that's the Feinberg problem, and there's a lot that you might want to look into here, but it is really interesting to me that, at least theoretically, it's not 100% hopeless from the get-go. Theoretically, there's an opening for a solution. All right. Ooh. Yeah, here are the properties of the second solution. Uh, the number of blocks that's required is independent of the number of outcomes. But the bad property is that aggregation fails if no outcome is a strong majority. Okay. Another fun and games problem. Remember this result, which says that if you're going to answer really large numbers of queries uh, uh, with non-trivial accuracy, then you can't have a completely distributed solution. There has to be coordination among the answers that are handed out. What does that tell you about privacy for the questions themselves? The answer I hand out for question number 26 depends on what was asked and maybe what I answered in question number three. So if this is a database that's usable by the public, later people who come in may learn something about what kinds of diseases the earlier people were trying to find out about. A potential privacy violation. Not for the data, the data stay private. Now it's privacy for the analyst. So the second interpretation of this theorem is that there's an analyst privacy problem. And the result that I'll just give you the shape of, I won't go to any proofs, is that there is a stateful algorithm providing differential privacy for the analyst. I'll go into a little bit more detail than this slide, but the general idea is this. The analysts are need, will need to have IDs, and I'll explain in a minute how they're used. Here's the database. It's going to be protected by, let's say, private multiplicative weights, which will guarantee some kind of alpha accuracy. Okay? Now, 
In private multiplicative weights, we are hiding very small changes to the data set. Let's say this is counting queries. We're, we're hiding sort of amounts on the order of 1 over n because it's fractional answers that we're giving, or 1 if it's flat out counting queries. The errors this thing makes are at most alpha. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of hide the history of what questions were asked before by using another version of private multiplicative weights that hides the errors that are introduced here. So these will be alpha hiding. So alpha sized deviations are, are going to be protected by privacy. So what happens? Um, okay. So the first analyst comes along, it asks a question, it interacts with the, an outer layer private multiplicative weights algorithm. That forwards the question onto the inner layer, which forwards, you know, consults the database, gives an answer, and the answer has noise in it to protect the privacy of the data. And then we do a little bit more noise in some sense to protect the privacy of small fluctuations in that answer A. All right, and we continue this way. Now the next analyst comes along, and we start up a new copy of the private multiplicative weights algorithm. This thing is going to make it impossible for analyst number two to figure out whether analyst number one was there or not. Why? Because all of the questions that analyst number one did will at most affect the answers that come out of here by, a, by alpha. Because that's the error, that it, that's accuracy promises. Things won't be wrong by more than alpha. And that accuracy guarantee stays there. So if we just hide those alpha changes, this guy doesn't see what that guy did. So that's how the algorithm works. This is Salil's um, animation and it's long. Uh, so it'll answer, yes? No, because we're using private multiplicative weights, so it can answer a large number of queries. It's not explicitly adding alpha noise. Remember that we proved an alpha beta utility guarantee for private multiplicative weights, even for very large numbers of queries. So it's that accuracy guarantee that tells us that no matter what questions were asked in the past, the, the later answers are still accurate to within alpha. And we're obscuring that by using alpha hiding out here. Okay. okay. So um, the main points are that differential privacy for the database is handled by the inner private multiplicative weights algorithm. And suppose we change the queries of all of the analysts but the last one. By alpha accuracy, the inner guy is still answering within about two, you know, plus or minus two alpha of truth. And so by essentially a generalization of differential privacy, the outer one will ensure that the distribution of answers to the last guy are similar. Okay. Um, open questions. So this gave differential privacy for the analyst. Is it possible to have perfect privacy? I don't know. What about collusion among the different, adversar of different adversarial analysts? I don't know. Um, we get a deterioration from the private multiplicative weights algorithm because of our sort of two-tiered two structure. And we're losing that extra alpha uh, utility. And you know, can, this got, can we do better? And there's been some progress on these last two questions recently, but it's not resolved. This is an open area. Okay, next problem. 
this was real. So there was uh, H1N1 swine flu, and there was um, a website that you could go to, and you would interact with the website a little bit, tell it a little bit about yourself, including some demographic information and uh, answering simple questions like, do you have a fever higher than this temperature? And I don't know, a couple other small things. And then it would tell you, uh, you might be at risk for the flu and you should see a doctor, or you probably don't have the flu, don't worry about it. Okay. And the website has the following question. Can we store and share your answers with health officials and researchers? So the website now wants to keep the data, this demographic information, from the individuals. He says it can be very helpful in monitoring regional health conditions, planned flu response, blah, 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 blah. But it also says, whoops, oh, it's not here. It also says, um, I'll tell you in a minute, maybe. So how might you use this? This is a famous real life example of how public health information was useful. This was John Snow's map of cholera cases in London. They didn't know how cholera was transmitted. But people were getting very, very sick. And he made a map of where the cholera cases were and where the wells were, the pumps that people were using for water. And he figured out what was going on. OK. So what else does the website says? It says, Microsoft may also disclose information if required to do so by law or good faith belief, blah, 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 blah. So this was some sort of boilerplate text that they put in. So they're asking you to give your info, but they're telling you, if we decide we want to, we will share this data. OK. So the worry is what we call mission creep. Now I've collected a bunch of data about people, and now I'm going to use it for some entirely different purpose other than different from the reason for which it was collected in the first place. How do you feel about that? And you don't get to tell me later, no, don't use it for this, do use it for that. So it's called mission creep. You know, here's the mission for why we're doing this, and now our mission is expanding and changing. So it's like, think of the children, and now you have to let your data be used. So what's an approach? One approach will be never store the data. So do your processing in some kind of way where you never have to store the data. Have you ever heard of any algorithms that do that? Have you ever heard of streaming algorithms? Good. So you might try streaming algorithms. Well, just because they're streaming algorithms doesn't mean they preserve privacy in the following sense. The streaming algorithms may store some samples that were gathered along the way. Streaming says we're not going to store a whole lot of data, typically. But it doesn't say I won't just happen to record Cynthia's data every time she shows up. So you want some kind of... Uh, Streaming algorithms, ooh, but streaming algorithms, even if their outputs are differentially private, I was worried about Microsoft, who was holding the data, now using it for something else. So it's not just enough that the outputs preserve privacy. I want the internal state of the algorithm to be privacy preserving. OK? So in order to make sense out of this, we also have to now define, what do we mean by my data? I mean. These people are interacting with the website. Three times during the month of February, I felt pretty lousy, and so I went and consulted with this thing. It's not a fixed static database anymore. It's changing. So what do we mean by my data? So we started this investigation into what we call pan-private algorithms. So these are algorithms that intuitively are private inside and out, that even if you combined all of the outputs with the internal state, you would completely hide the pattern of appearances of any individual, their presence, their absence, their frequency, and so on. So the model is that data arrive in a stream, for example, search queries, and the data of different users are interleaved completely arbitrarily. I could ask two questions that show up next to each other, or they could be interleaved with somebody else's, and so on. Um, the curator sees each item and updates its internal state. 
So here's how it looks. Here's the data stream. So yellow is the data of one person, gray is the data of another person, blue is the data of a third person, and so on. Or a query posed by the third person, or whatever. And all I'm worrying about now is the names. I'm not even worrying about what they were actually querying. So the algorithm has some internal state. It receives the first input. It uh, reads the next input. It reads the next input, and so on. And um, did I tell you it was continuously producing outputs? That's the next topic. Right now, it's just processing a stream, and it's going to say something at the end. But we want its internal state, together with what it says at the end, to be private. That's why in this little animation, no outputs were being produced yet. So informally, pan privacy says that for every possible behavior of a user in the stream, the joint distribution of the final output and the internal state at any single point in time, so like you get a subpoena and you come in and you look at the internal state, uh, um, everything is, should be differentially private. How can you possibly compute anything in this way? You can't take notes. I mean, what do you do? Well, there's actually some interesting things that you can do. Sufficiently interesting that it's worth formalizing a requirement. So we have a universe X of items, like usernames. And in this notation, let's, sorry, these were from different talks. So now little X is just a username, a database item. Um, two streams are X adjacent if, if we remove all of the occurrences of x in both of them, we get the same output. OK? It's a very intuitive definition. And there's a natu natural notion of corresponding prefi prefixes in x adjacent strings. So uh, x adjacency says that uh, two streams are capital x adjacent if there is some individual in x for which they're x adjacent. Okay. So notice that strings of very different lengths can be adjacent to each other, because we're trying to hide my presence or absence from the entire stream. And I could have put in one query, six queries, or 600 queries. We have to hide me no matter what. So we have pan privacy under one intrusion if let's say, the adversary gets to exactly once examine the internal state of the algorithm and, of course, also see the output. Okay. So here's something that you can do. We have a universe X of people. We want to know what fraction of the people have visited this website. All right? Sounds really hard. You can't take notes in terms of who showed, because if you took notes, then one intrusion would reveal somebody's name. So you can't keep a list of all the users that have appeared. You can't keep random subsample of the users that have appeared. Uh, and even hashing, which is a technique that shows up in a lot of algorithms, hashing is not differentially private. You know, my name hashes to this. Uh, Sanjeev's name doesn't hash to this, so if, if we see this, we can rule him out, and uh, he has zero probab... I'm sorry. Aww. Well, you can make up an example where this works, right? My name hashes to something that's recorded. In some other database, I don't show up, and there is no hash of anybody to that value. So a hash value appears here with some probability, here with zero probability, ratio bad. OK, so we can't hash. Oh, does anybody want to guess how to do it? Suppose I tell you you can have lots and lots of internal state if you want. You actually know the tool that will let you do this. OK, here's what we do. I'll tell you the very, very big state one. There's a smaller state one, but that obscures the point. So I'm going to have a giant table with one bit for every possible user. I'm going to have two similar probability distributions. Let me call them D0 and D1. D0 is 50-50, 0-1. D1 
one is slightly biased toward one. Now, we initialize the table by choosing from D0, in other words, flipping a coin, for every entry in the table. So the table initially is completely random. And now we start processing the stream. Every time I appear, we choose from D1 and record the output. If I appear 10 times in the stream, every single time we ignore what's currently written, we choose again from D1 and record the output. So the database will look exactly the same if I have appeared one, two, three, four, one million, seven million times, doesn't matter. The database will appear be almost the same distribution whether I appear zero times or one time. Why? Because this is just randomized response for each bit. And, you know, you can answer fractional queries with randomized response. You already saw that. So that's how we do that. So you can actually do something in this model. And it turns out you can do a few different things in this model. Okay. Um, multiple intrusions are more complicated because in some sense you would have to refresh the table each time. Moreover, if you don't know an intrusion has happened because somebody hacked into your system rather than the police coming with a legal court order saying we get to see your internal state, if, then you can't tell how many times it's happened and you don't know when you need to refresh your, initial random, your internal randomness. So there are, there are theorems about what can happen here. All right, um, another problem. Let's go back to the John Snow map. This was a static situation. Let's say a lot of people had been sick, so he makes the map once, and he analyzes the map. Okay. But we're interested in the case where we actually want to follow the spread of a disease over time, or just some other kind of online monitoring. So we have a continual observation algorithm, which is an algorithm that produces an observable output at every time step. For example, there are certain pages where if you visit them, it tells you, you are the 700th person to visit this page. Right? This is a continual output kind of situation. Um, citations. If you ask Google Scholar how many times has this paper been cited, It'll tell you. Uh, okay. So let's not worry about pan privacy right now. Let's just worry about the outputs. So the output is the algorithm has some kind of state. It processes the first data item. Tell me you're going to produce output. It processes the second one. Ah, it decides to produce an output. Processes the third one produces an output, and so on. Okay, so now, in this model, the adversary, like, we're talking about how, m monitoring a system over time. The adversary knows what time it is, right? So, if you're looking at how many citations there are, the adversary can tell the difference between whether, an, I mean. You, yes, it can tell whether it was cited on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday. It can tell that it was not cited for several days in a row. It knows what time it is. So we say we have to have a different notion of adjacency now. Uh, that will allow us to capture time. So we say that two things are ex-adjacent if there are two data items in the set so that one string can be obtained from the other by replacing some number of occurrences of x with x prime, and we introduce an extra symbol bottom to indicate nothing happened. So now we can hide my presence at time t 
by replacing my access to something with the symbol bottom. And we want to be sure that the adversary can't tell the difference. So what kinds of things do we do in this model? Well, first of all, there's a general theorem that allows us for monotone functions uh, to say if you have a, um, uh, a pan-private algorithm for the monotone function, then we can get a pan-private algorithm under continual observation. But a fun one that I'll tell you a little bit about instead of the heavy hitting one is counters. We've been talking about counters informally. How many times was the paper cited? So counters. What we want to do here now is we want to be able to handle event level privacy. So um, yeah, the, the way this paper, the, the way Moni Naor phrased this originally was Moni, who had been Guy Rothblum's master's advisor, uh, phrased the problem as, does Guy do what he is told? Moni tells Guy, go read this paper and of mine, I mean, you know, of Moni's. And then Moni checks, how many people have come to his website to download papers? Guy didn't download the paper last night because the count didn't change. So the question was, does Guy do what he's told? And we want to give Guy privacy. And this is a kind of event level privacy. We want to know not whether he ever read any paper of Moni's, but whether he did what he was told and read it last night. So there turn, although you know, this is a kind of silly motivation, there are many applications of counters that give you this kind of privacy. And the literature talks about these a little bit. They include aggregating expert advice, minimizing regret, uh, and counter-based user-level pan-private algorithms. Event-level privacy is a much, much weaker guarantee than user-level privacy. User-level privacy says we hide all of the, this user's appearances in the stream. Event-level privacy says we'll hide a few. You know. OK, so how do you do the counter? Though, as I said, this is flavors of results. We also have counter distortion, lower bounds under continual intrusion. Fine. So, sorry. Uh, ah, this is what the picture should be. Suppose we knew in advance how long we wanted to run the counter for, you know, some number t units of time. Let's assume for simplicity that t is a power of 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to maintain counter counters for all these sort of natural intervals whose lengths are powers of two. So let me just show you the pattern. It's easier than giving the formal description. So one power of two is one, so there's a counter for each of these intervals. One power of two is two, so there's a counter for each of these intervals. Right? One is four, and so on. So you get the pattern, right? Now, these are counters that initially, before they are completed, before their time interval is completed, we keep them secret. And this is not a pan-private algorithm. The internal state does have information in it. That can be fixed, but for now, it's pan-private. So we're going to count how many people have shown up. Let's say this counter is showing how many people showed up in steps um, uh, blah, 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 blah. That must be 8, so 9, 10, 11, and 12, something like that. All right? When that interval is finished, we add Laplace noise to the result, and we publish that. So whenever an interval is finished, a noisy version of how many events took place in there is published. Now, suppose at time i, I want to know how many events have taken place up through time i. So what I do is I find a union of, at most, log 2 of t segments, disjoint segments, that cover the time interval from 1 through i. And you know how to do this. You get this from the binary representation of i. So we only need, to give an answer, we only need log of t segments. Now, how many segments can any given time i appear in? 
again at most log of t. So we can add noise that's scaled to log of t over epsilon. And then by a Chernoff style bound for the sum of Laplaces, we actually can show, oh, what did I do wrong? Right, that's how many segments there are, but I'm adding up log t of them. So we're going to get a bit more noise than log t. It'll be with high probability at most log t to the 1.5 over epsilon. Now this last one, and this is the last one, it's a short lecture, uh, I want you to help me solve this problem. You have a number of tools at your disposal, and I want you to try to figure out uh, an approach to this. So the general problem is traffic reporting. Uh, in a place where the traffic isn't quite as bad as it is here. So that sometimes the roads are empty, and sometimes they're a little crowded, and sometimes they're very crowded. Oh, and that's what the, you're familiar with pictures like this? The, the, the green is showing that you can drive at the speed limit in here. The yellow is showing that it's a little bit slow, and the red is showing it's very congested. Okay. So. Uh, how does Google Maps get this data? Well, they get it from the Android phones. They monitor people's Android phones and see, I mean, I think this is how they do it, and see how fast they're moving and draw some conclusions from there. And what we'd like to do is guarantee some kind of privacy for the phone users. So... Privacy should be easy, right? There are a lot of cars. Your presence or absence doesn't usually affect traffic very much, so it should be easy. Why might it be hard? If you're the only one driving, that's interesting. That's a very interesting suggestion. There's something to that. What else? Only care about the release data. Good question. We're, this is like we're back to the standard model now. What problems does it remind you of? What did we just talk about? Are we doing this just once or are we doing this all the time? It's a continual situation. What else? does it remind you of? Let's see why it might be a hard problem. I mean, the word continual should give you an idea of why it might be hard. You drive all the time. You constantly are affecting things a little bit. And moreover, there's a lot of public information to help the attacker. Like on the radio, they tell you the 101 freeway is you know, slow between here and here and stuff like that. And you might even cause a traffic jam, in which case your presence or absence makes a really big difference. Right. We'll give an example. So we want to sort of privately report average speeds on, say, Shoreline Boulevard. That's right near our lab. Right now. And this is easy. You know how to privately report one number. The problem here is that we want the average speeds on all major roads at all times. That's a lot of measurements, a whole lot of measurements. And if you drive much more slowly than a lot of the people around you, that might show up. If you drive a whole lot more quickly than the other people on the road, that might show up. OK. So any more ideas yet on how to do this?
or any problems come to mind? Any techniques that you've seen come to mind? Well, think about what you know about traffic. During rush hour, is the street in downtown Hyderabad likely to be crowded or not crowded? Right, so they tell it's crowded, so what? You knew this already anyway. In the middle of the night, the street in downtown Hyderabad, crowded or not crowded? Not crowded. The traffic report says it's not crowded, but you knew this anyway. It's, like, it's the middle of the night. No one's driving. Of course it's not crowded. Is this starting to sound like something familiar? A whole lot of the time you already know the answer, and it's only interesting when there's some kind of a weirdness that happens, an anomaly of some sort. What technique? What was that? The one that adapted the data is based on the function insignificant. Data. Exactly. So it's starting to sound like sparse vector. Sparse vector seems so far, we don't have like a perfect answer to this problem yet, but it seems so far to be a better approach than the continual observation stuff. That's, it has been more useful. So here we, we want to say, suppose we could predict the answer to every query. What's the speed? What speed are people going uh, on Shoreline Boulevard at 10 at night? 35 miles an hour, if there's anybody. What about at 11? 35 miles an hour. At midnight, 35 miles an hour, right? So most of the time, we, most of the time, really, because we know so much, so much information, auxiliary information is out there in the public's domain. The whole history of everything that ever happened is public. So, a lot of times we can predict. So we could just pr report the predictions and almost all the time we're going to be right. It's great. Now suppose we could just instead predict the answers to most queries. We want to use the private measurements to correct for our bad predictions. So you expect it to be 35 miles an hour, but it turns out to be 5 miles an hour. So instead of answering 35 as usual, oh gosh, I'm sorry, I messed up the slide. I messed up the slide. So suppose this were 32. You'd say, it's pretty close to 35 significant, uh, insignificant. So I'll just say 35, which is what we predicted, which is in keeping with the sparse vector approach. But now, Instead, suppose it's five miles an hour. So 35 minus five, that's a big difference. This is significant. So you want to report something closer to the truth. Five, or close to it. Okay, so sparse vector seems promising in this setting. But of course, we're running predictions and sparse vector all over the place. We still haven't gotten away from the fact that we're monitoring traffic all of the place, all of the time. So we can't necessarily even use sparse vector everywhere. Whenever our prediction is wrong, we're going to pay for a failure. That's what significant meant as opposed to insignificant. We, we pay something. So did we win? Have we gotten anywhere? Not clear. Anything else come to mind? This is not an obvious one. Sparse vector was fairly obvious. This is, this is not obvious. But you've actually seen some technology that helps you at least to think about this problem in a way that leads to something that could be considered a solution. can't be independent at all places, right? Where did we see something like that? Uh, wrong direction. Wrong direction. Remember the difference between epsilon zero differential privacy and epsilon delta? 
Epsilon zero said simultaneously for all pairs, so fix x, simultaneously for all adjacent x prime, you can't distinguish x from x prime. Epsilon delta allowed a relaxation of that. It says fix x and x prime with high probability you can't tell the difference. So it's kind of like that, or it's kind of like this thing that I told you to think about with advanced composition where for the databases that I'm actually in, you can't sort of tell that I was in them or not, but it doesn't protect my absence simultaneously from all of the other databases. That's again the same sort of epsilon delta-ish guarantee. This like, not quite the quantifiers that you would have wanted, but still not necessarily bad. So we'll do something analogous. In some sense, we'll say that two traffic databases, which are, of course, being updated all the time, uh, are neighbors. If they differ only on one user's data, and moreover, it's epsilon differentially private for database D and driver I, and we'll name the root R. If for every, every event in the range, the probability that we see this event, oh, yes, when um, we have database D, is very close to what happens on the neighboring database D prime where the driver's root R is deleted from the database. So this database has the driver's root, this one has it deleted. Okay? So this should be a very, very familiar feeling to you. This should feel like this is the third time or so that you're seeing it. So what does this definition protect? It'll protect things like you said you were going to the bank, but in fact you stayed home and took a nap. Can't tell the difference. Um, you stayed home. I'm sorry. It should be D prime. In the database D prime, where you drove to the bank, the prediction may be failed on the way to the bank. Actually, this will work. This statement is true whether it's D or D prime. It's like, well, maybe we're predicting clear traffic, but if I go, that would just take things over the edge and make it congested. So we want to protect my presence or absence in that way. And this definition assumes, I mean, protects the case where the adversary sort of only gets one measurement to help it distinguish between the case where I stayed home or I went to the bank. Obviously, it'll give slightly worse protection for the adversary, against the adversary who can take several me measurements. And this thing works fine if we're just trying to distinguish between whether Cynthia stayed home or went to the bank. It's completely, and, and the adversary doesn't care that there's some presidential motorcade somewhere else that's causing strange traffic jams everywhere. So predictions were failing over there, but on the routes that I might have driven, nothing's happening that's really weird, so everybody's just going with the predictions. Here's what it doesn't protect. I am the presidential motorcade. Everywhere I go, I cause traffic jams and strange behavior. Okay? So it doesn't protect whether this traffic demon is staying still or moving. Um, Maybe for some other reason in the database D, the prediction will fail exactly where I am, where I'm going. It won't protect that. Uh, if the adversary gets a whole lot of measurements, it doesn't protect against that. And I have no idea what can happen. What we can, I mean, this is like thinking in process. I don't know what we can do to make things better here. You might wonder, where did these predictions come from? And I already hinted at that. How, you know, we want to use, we want to rely on the sparse vector technique. The sparse vector technique requires that the adversary actually knows most of the time what to expect. 
in the private multiplicative weights algorithm or in the sparse, right, um, private multiplicative weights algorithm, the adversary knows this sort of, what were we calling it? The estimate, x sub t. In the sparse vector algorithm, the adversary knows the expected value insignificant. Only learn something new when it gets a value of significant. So where do we get the information for this setting? Well, we want to exploit what's publicly known. So there's a huge amount of public data. Uh, there's historical data. There's the accident reports from the police scanner. If we're Microsoft and we're trying to protect privacy for people using, who are allowing us to predict traffic using their data, we can say, hey, the Google data is public data. It's published. I can use it in my predictor. It's kind of a joke, but all right. Uh, event calendars, you know, there's on, sh on Shoreline Boulevard, at the end of Shoreline, there's um, uh, an outdoor theater that has big concerts. But the schedule for these concerts is, of course, publicly known. We know that if there is a concert scheduled at 8, the traffic will be really bad after 7, you know, that kind of thing. Um, there are traffic cameras that are, you know, um, showing on the web. So there's a lot of stuff that we could mobilize, and they can be combi combined into an effective model. So you can use them, and you can feed them into a predictor and get some kind of expected behavior and only signal changes from that. Okay, that's the end.